Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1971 Italian giallo film, The Bloodstained Butterfly. And this is my first time seeing a film by Duccio Tessari. And this is a good one. I actually enjoyed this. This doesn't like crack my top 10 or anything like that, but it is a good giallo film that was worth it because the story was interesting. And I will go into a bunch of that stuff. So obviously, spoilers for this one because I've been doing spoilers for all these giallo films because they're old, you know. So this one was directed, like I said, by Duccio Tessari, who also did such scripts as, or such films as Death Occurred Last Night, Winged Devils, and Puzzle. Those are just a few other horror films that he did. Uh, Tessari was also involved in writing the script for this one, and so was Gianfranco Clerici, who you might know from some other scripts, such as Macabre, Don't Torture a Duckling, Five Women for the Killer, Jungle Holocaust, Cannibal Holocaust, the New York Ripper, and Delirium. So quite a resume there. And it's funny because I'm doing this review and there's that tie with uh, Giancarlo as a writer with Cannibal Holocaust. And the last Giallo review I did was for the Pajama Girl case. And there was the tie with Riz Ortolani doing the score for that one who also did for Cannibal Holocaust. So just kind of funny. Um, also, this was also titled uh, Secret of the Black Rose. I believe that was when it was released in Germany, that was the title for it, which both are good. So I guess I should show you at this point. I watched it on this Arrow Blu-ray that I got. Sorry, I'm trying not to get too much glare on it, but it looks good. Uh, if you can see, let me see if I can get you a good look. Because it is really good artwork. Like, look at how good that artwork is. Really cool artwork. So I do like the cover of this. Anyway, the opening music is a very grandiose. It had a very big score, a big orchestral kind of classical at times score, which I kind of liked. It helped with a little bit more of the emotional side of things because with the script, obviously, they were going for a lot of emotional stuff, especially with the ending where you find out that... Uh, um, what's his name, Giorgio, th that Giorgio had basically had this master plan from the get-go to take out Alessandro uh, because of Fran Francois, who he had been seeing in addition to Sarah. So yeah, and that was, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, the So here was the quote that popped up in the very beginning of the film. The past does not exist since it is already gone by, nor does the future exist since it is yet to come. Therefore, only the present exists, but it may be composed of past and future since it is where they meet. So I think this is just kind of supposed to give you an idea that you can't necessarily trust what's happened in someone's past what it looks like things are going to be like in the future. You have to live in the present of the film in order to take the ride along with it and figure out what actually happened. So yeah, that's just my interpretation of it. There's probably some other interpretations though. A nice quiet afternoon outside and then what do you know, a dead body rolls down the hill. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. Actually, zero times, but I thought that was funny that that's kind of how things get going with this is the woman with her kids in the uh, in the wooded area, and then all of a sudden a dead body, Francois, comes rolling down the hill, and they're like, oh no. So it's just kind of funny. Um, when there are scenes of the killer running in Giallo, I always pay close attention to how they run, kind of like their gait of how they run and how they do things, because a lot of the times when they're showing someone running, uh, it can end up looking more feminine versus masculine, although that doesn't always lead to who the killer actually was but I'm always looking for those clues because I'm always just trying to figure it out ahead of time I know a lot of people say that why do you do that that you know takes a lot of the fun out of it I don't know it's more fun for me to try and guess just saying but um, I didn't really see anything in when the killer was running away um, but I always look for that stuff oh yes always a sex maniac is suspected in these instances and this film is no different i was expecting it as soon as the police officers the inspectors were giving out all their theories i was like where is it where is it sex maniac ah, there it is sex maniac there's always the sex maniac guess and that's what they go with and it you know i mean it was it basically was in this instance 
And in general, it was, everyone's a sex maniac, basically. Everyone's getting it on in this film. I mean, you got Alessandro, who was a killer. You got uh, Giorgio, who was also a killer, but was also having a lot of sex. You had uh, Maria and the attorney. Uh, I forget what his name is at the moment. Julio, I think it was. They were having sex. Sarah was having sex. Francois was having sex. Marta was having sex. Like, everyone's having sex in this. Everyone. And it's really messy relationship-wise, which I think adds to some kind of unintended comedy at certain times. And I'll talk about one in particular a little bit later that I had appreciation for because of how the story went. I do like the evidence processing um, and working through theories of the events. Uh, I do really like that. It felt very nicely procedural at that point. And, for, I mean, in general, this, this film did feel kind of like inspector slash police procedural. In fact, so much so that I feel like it feels a little bit like a precursor to something like a, sh a Law and Order show in the United States. You know, granted, this was, you know, decades before, but it kind of feels like the precursor to a show like that. Because if you think about it, it's, you know, they do kind of their procedural thing of them going over, you know, the crime scene and then talking about their theories and then doing the investigations. But they have so much focusing on the actual court events, too, which a lot of Giallo films don't spend a lot of time in the courts, um, usually because they're trying to figure, like, they, there's, there's usually not any sort of trial going on. And in this, it, it, it's weird because it ended up being that the person who was first suspected and put on trial actually ended up being the initial killer. But you just have that twist thrown in there of more killings happening and why. So there you go. So I did like that it was kind of like a fresh script. You see another victim coming when the student almost gets hit by the white convertible, especially since you just see the top half of the driver's face. Now that was actually a bit of a red herring. Obviously we did get more people getting killed, but at that moment when like Sarah almost gets hit by the white convertible and they only showed like from here, like from here up on the person, I was like, oh, I think she's going to get killed. She didn't end up getting killed. Other people did though. Alessandro is arrested because of his coat having mud on it. But then the fingerprint comparison actually looks really interesting. I I was going in between like like the whole thing where where it seemed like they were arresting him based off mud on his coat, but then they start throwing everything out when they're actually in the court proceedings, especially the fingerprint comparison, which why wasn't that a bigger thing at the end of the film, honestly, before he got exonerated. That that's kind of crazy. But um, it, it was good because they, they it started a little bit shaky, but they really, the prosecution really did build a good case to a point where I was like, ah, you know, maybe this is the guy. In which case, I can't figure out how this is a giallo. But then the attorney, um, Julio, steps in and he starts just taking things down. He just starts being like, well, in this case, you know, it could be this. And in this case, it could be this. Obviously, for the mud on the jacket is when Alessandro... Well, Alessandro told his attorney that, you know, he got it thrown onto his jacket from a car passing by that hit a, a muddy puddle. You know, he had all these, he was a good attorney. He had all the ways to take down these bits of evidence and whatever the prosecution was, prosecution was showing, which is obviously why in the end he got off. Actually, a portion of why he got off. The main reason he got off is because um, Giorgio was out there killing other women and making it look the same as when Alessandro did it. I like the shot of Sarah and Giorgio moving in different directions on the street, but they st stayed in the same frame together. I thought that was a really cool shot. That was when uh, Giorgio had first um, testified. And if you catch, you know, Sarah says something about, you know, thank you for, for telling the truth. And he says something about, like, being a fable but if you tell a fable enough or something, it becomes the truth in essence. Like you can make a fable truth. It was something to that uh, to that degree, which actually gives you a hint that he was lying in there. And when you think back on it after the end of the film, you realize that it, that was hard for him because he hates Alessandro, obviously, because he knows that Alessandro killed Francois. So he, there he is trying his best to get Alessandro off so that in the end he can do what he did and kill him himself, get his revenge for taking his love from him. 
Uh, but that shot after uh, to get back to it. Sorry, real roundabout way to get there. That shot where they they come out of the court and Sarah is like walking towards the camera and um, Giorgio's walking kind of away and to the side, but they stay in the frame together. Really, really good looking. And in general, you know, the directing is very good with this. The camera movements in particular, lots and lots of interesting movements, lots of kind of movements moving around the characters and kind of opening scenes up a lot more, which I always say I like because it makes me as an audience member feel more engaged uh, in the scene because I feel like I get more of a perspective of what the scene is, like what's going on. It makes you feel more a part of it. Um, Giorgio seems real suspect when he's acting odd and turning music up while ignoring Sarah. Now, note at that part where he is seeming very suspect, he hasn't killed anyone yet. He is innocent at that point where he's flipping out when Sarah's trying to talk to him and I guess it's in his place and he's just like having the music and he's kind of like there like this, like, Ugh, you know, because he's obviously going through some stuff because he misses Francois, but he can't really talk to Sarah about that because she... He was seeing both of them at the same time, in essence. So They keep throwing mini twists, like Alessandro's affair with Marta and, Mar and Maria hiding Alessandro's shirt that had blood on it. And then you throw into it Julio sleeping with Maria. And this is what I was talking about, about like the intricacy of these relationships. You know, you had Alessandro and Maria who are married. Now, Alessandro is cheating on Maria with Marta. And Maria is cheating on Alessandro with his attorney, Julio. And then you had uh, Giorgio, who was with Sarah, but also cheating on Sarah with Francois. It's just like so much deception. And then the deception of the script and the story with the audience goes hand in hand. I get that having extreme close-ups is one way to get around the nudity portion of sex scenes, but it's actually extremely annoying, especially when they draw it out, and they really did that in this in this film. Um, you don't need to have a super long sex scene, especially when you're just showing very, very close-ups, so you're not really showing nudity or anything. There's no point, you know, like, it, it's just annoying. Like, move the camera back. I feel claustrophobic because you're way too close to these people. So that's one of the directorial things I did not really like. But there wasn't that much. I like the jump from Julio meeting the prostitute to her being dead while the police process the crime scene. You know, obviously that's supposed to be a very strong indicator that, you know, Julio may have been the person to kill this prostitute, which is the first death after Francois' initial death. Um, because he's getting, he's going to get some cigarettes and she's there at the same cigarette machine and then it's just like immediately jump to, she's dead. And this pack of cigarettes are still sitting there. So that's supposed to make the audience grab that red herring and be like, oh, Julio could be the killer. Which would also be an interesting twist. But I like what they did with it. I laughed when Giorgio put out his birthday candles with a glass of water. You could see him emotionally going through some stuff. You could also see that he didn't have a very good relationship with his family. Um, so much so that, you know, they couldn't really pick up that there was something going on with him. And he was mad about it at the table. He gets his birthday cake and then he just takes his glass of water and dumps it. I like that. Yuck, what a gross scene with Julio throwing himself all over Sarah. That was disgusting. So Ju when you do that, that is yet another one of those red herrings to be like, oh, Julio is a sex maniac, potentially the person who killed Francois. Um, because he here he is, he's in a relationship with Maria well, he's married, then he's in a Mar has Maria on the side, then he's going after Maria's daughter, Sarah. Pretty gross, but yeah, it was a gross scene. When the third victim is being followed and the cigarette is put out, it insinuates Julio as the killer once again. They were really working that Julio angle pretty hard um, because you had the one prostitute that was killed after seeing Julio getting cigarettes and then the cigarette pack next to her. Then for the second prostitute that ends up getting killed, you get... Uh, the showing of just like the from the legs to the shoes, like shin to shoes, and then someone putting out a cigarette, and that's supposed to make you think back to Julio once again and be like, ah, man, it should it should be Julio, but it's not. It's actually Giorgio. What an awkward meal with Maria, Julio, Alessandro, and Sarah. Lots of tension there. 
I thought that was a really funny scene. I really love that scene because when they're sitting there, it feels awkward. It feels like there's a tension at the table. And you as an audience member are just thinking back to, okay, there's a lot of cheating going on here and there's a lot of mistrust going on here, but they're sitting at this table trying to be civil and try to like have a meal. And it's just kind of funny to think about that. So I love that scene for that reason. I mean, out of context, that's just a really like whatever boring scene, but within the context of the storyline and what's going on, I love it. Now, Berardi, the Inspector Berardi, never gets his coffee the way he wants it. That's a funny little thing that they put in there. Like, he's continually getting this coffee from his assistant, and it's never exactly the way he wants it. Like, it's either too cold or it's too sugary or it's too hot. I think the first time, there's too much sugar in it. The second time, it's too hot. And then the third time... Oh, no. The second time, it's too cold. The third time, it's too hot. But I thought that was a little bit funny. Alessandro seems to be walking through the old building for quite some time at the end when he's showing up because he was just on the phone and he gets this word about blackmail because uh, obviously someone knows what's going on, but it's actually Giorgio trying to lure him to a secluded place in order to do the deed and get rid of him, which was his plan ever since Francois was killed, basically. Uh, but it, it feels like Alessandro's taking a long time going through the building. I understand that you can do something like that to kind of try to build tension, but I don't feel like it really did enough of that because it went on a little too long. I think it should have been cut down at least a little bit. Excuse me. Giorgio showed a gun earlier in the film. That means it needed to be used. So this is when it gets used is when he uses it for its initial intent, which is to kill Alessandro. Now, I had that in the back of the, my, my mind. Someone had actually made a comment on one of my other reviews who reminded me it's Chekhov's gun is what the term the proper term for that is that if you see the the gun earlier in the film it will be used in some way later on I think that was during my review of uh Death Walks on High Heels so we saw the gun and Chekhov's gun says it has to be used later and it is used later by Giorgio so Giorgio killed two women so that Alessandro would go free and he could get revenge for killing Francois. I do like this twist to it. And I will say that for the whole film, I was really having a hard time figuring out who in the end I thought it was definitely going to be. I mean, I did oscillate a few times. I did think for a little bit, maybe it was um, Julio, but then they were throwing too many hints out there about Julio that I was like, ah, they're going a little too hard on him. I don't think so. So I don't, I didn't really figure it out in the end what that twist was, because one of the other things is you really are trying to figure out that initial kill, the initial murder, and then when the other two murders happen, that makes you think, oh, well, Alessandro must be, you know, innocent, which is what ends up happening with the characters in the story. That's, they're like, oh, he must be innocent because prostitutes are getting killed continually. So, yeah. So it's, it works. It works. They do a good job with it. And I like the story. I like they chose to go that way. The combination of the music and the cutting in of scenes of Giorgio and Francois being extremely happy actually helps to make some really good kind of emotional impact at the very end after Giorgio has shot Alessandro and then Giorgio has been stabbed. And honestly, I kind of get the feeling that as he's laying there dying that Giorgio is kind of okay with that just because he it, it seemed like he didn't really have a will to live past not being able to be with Francois. So the fact that he would go out and murder other people, like he knows he's putting himself in a situation where he could eventually be found out. He could be taken to jail. Um, so it seems he was just living for this revenge. And since he got it, he'd actually be relatively okay with just dying after that because he doesn't even want to live without Francois. You see all the emotional pain that he goes through throughout the film. So... This is one of those films that I feel like I definitely do want to watch again because of all the nuances of of what was going on and knowing that at the end of the film and then going back and seeing all the extra stuff at play on a second viewing would be great. Um, it's really engaging because you feel like you don't know where it's going. Like I was saying, I wasn't able to really um, suss it out. I think... The procedural aspect of it, like I was talking about in the beginning, how in-depth they get with the with the uh, the court proceedings, I think is actually interesting. Uh, I like how they keep throwing in these kind of mini-twists within it. That keeps you engaged. 
and then just you know not necessarily knowing who it's going to end up being in the end works real well and like i said this feels like the precursor to things like law and order it's weird so anyway, out of five stars with half stars in play for this one, I'm going to give it a three and a half star rating. I think it is good. It's not like amazing. It's not the best Giallo I've ever seen, but it's pretty good. I'm going to give it a three and a half star rating. Um, I'd love to hear what other people have to say about it. So you can put it down in the comments. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Are you in between? Because uh, I'm always down to talk about Giallo. And if you don't know, I have an entire playlist on my channel of Giallo film reviews. So you can check that out. I think this is my 39th, maybe? I'm getting there. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, but anyway, uh, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button. That is your way to repay me. If you like this video or any video I have ever done, that's your way to repay me. And it keeps me motivated. It keeps me going. Whenever I see I get new subscribers, I'm like, there is someone who actually appreciated something that I put out there. So I should keep putting stuff out. So I do really appreciate that. Also hit the notification bell button, though. Because that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos. Um, so you can check those out. Whether it's one of these or a haul video or any of that stuff. But regardless, I really do thank you for taking your time to check this out. Until next time, keep it brutal.